Now we have our next presentation. Uh, it, who here was here for the first DevOps Days Ohio? Hey, you guys are awesome. Hand for you guys. I'm going to make you applaud a lot. So some of you will remember Carmen D'Angelo's presentation where he, he's a leader at Nationwide who started the project, the initiative to introduce DevOps culture and practices to the organization. So it's been a couple years since then, and we have Jared and Preston who are going to be telling us about where Jared or where Nationwide is in their journey now introducing those practices. Jared, role there, his role there is being a, a high-level technical person. He's been an architect nationwide, and really over the past year and a half, he's been focusing on introducing DevOps to the organization. And then Jared is a, they call it a consultant, but he goes throughout the organization and talks about DevOps and how the practices can help nationwide accelerate delivery. So big hand to these two folks. They're going to be sharing their story with us now. All right, uh, hi everybody. This is uh, it's a lot of nationwide people here, so we kind of got a little home field advantage going on. So, uh, all right, so this is nationwide. <laughs> yeah, woo! <laughs> so this is nationwide's journey to accelerate delivery. I'm Preston Waller. I've been with Nationwide for seven years. Uh, during that time, I've been a developer and an architect, and currently I'm working in a DevOps tools and technology group. And our role is to spread DevOps tools and technology and processes and principles throughout the enterprise. So we work with different business areas and different application areas to get that done. And my name is Jared Spino. I've been with Nationwide for about nine years now. In my time, I've also been a developer and an architect. And additionally, I've done operations and on-call support. Uh, in my current role, as Warner said, I'm a technical consultant that helps teams uh, implement DevOps practices. All right, so uh, let's start out with a little bit about Nationwide. So from a consumer standpoint, a lot of people think of Nationwide as just an insurance company. But because of our banking and retirement plan, we also have a little bit of a space in the financial area. So from a consumer, we're number one in uh, small business uh, insurance, pet insurance, 457 retirement plans, uh, farm and ranch insurance, and corporate life. And we have members in every state in the US. From an employer standpoint, Nationwide's been in business for 90 years. We have about 34,000 employees. And for the past few years, we've been on Fortune's 100 best places to work. So to have an organization like that, you need a really good IT organization to support it. So for all of the work that we do, we have about over 200 agile lines, and I think we said it's about 210. We were talking about this yesterday. So within those lines, we have over 2,600 um, dev developers and testers. And those developers and testers, they, uh, they span quite a bit of technology. You got everything from JavaScript, Java, um, Ruby, Groovy, Perl, uh, even all the way to COBOL. So, it's, uh, you know, it's quite a, a, a big range. I like that. Yeah, COBOL. <laughs> All right. So, <laughs> so and then that, that group of individuals, they handle and do new development for and also uh, maintain over 2,500 applications. All right. So we're going to talk a little bit about how our Agile lines work just really quickly. Um, so right now, our Agile lines, we're really good with uh, our design, our develop, and our testing. We do a lot of work right there, and it's, we're always um, innovating, and we're always getting faster at what we do. Now, the problem is when we do that, the work coming in and the work going out, that's where we have a little bit of a slowdown. So on one end, we have a uh, really a complex planning process for every project. So the way that we work is annually groups are given a budget and they have to take that budget and do all kinds of planning for all the projects that they want done for the year. So with that complex planning process, what ends up happening is there's a lot of people on the front end doing a lot of work and then what happens is we actually end up spending about, for every project, 60% of the budget before anyone even writes a line of code. So. Yeah, he's shaking his, Cobol's shaking his head over there. He understands what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> all 
So on the other end, we have a very time-based uh, process for delivering our projects to production. And in that, there's, it's a big high ceremony thing. There's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of setup for that. And then anytime you need to deploy something, we only deploy one weekend a month during the year. So in reality, if you're really good, you're deploying your application 12 times a year. If you're not so good, your application is getting deployed two times a year, or maybe one time a year. And so I'll talk a little bit about that process here in a few minutes. So, all right, so this is uh, our journey. And now, this is a little bit strange because even though it says where we've been and where we're going, aside from the move from waterfall to agile, we're really closer on that side of where we've been with everything else in the architecture, release, and infrastructure role. So I've talked a little bit about how we're, we, have, um, we have our development teams or, or agile teams. But for the architecture, so like I said before, the way that we do that funding and the way that we do that work, we actually end up architecting these monolithic applications. So you might have some reusability in your code, but most of that reusability is within the same application. You're not using that reusability to go outside of other applications. And so having that kind of interdependency, you know, if there's ever a problem in your application, you might have a problem and you fix that problem, but then you might accidentally break something else in your application. So, and even this having those monolithic, monolithic applications, I'm gonna talk a little bit about our culture and how siloed we are at times, but even in those applications, you may have the same set of data, but that data might be housed in a different application where another application could use that data, but because of the way we build things, they can't get to that data, all right? Now, our release is, like I said, we release once a month, and those are very coordinated, large batch sizes, and there's very long lead times. If you're gonna release something within one of the monthly releases, you have to tell them weeks in advance that you're gonna deploy something, all right? So, and that means that we have a release night every month, and that is a very long night for everyone involved. So at midnight at night, everyone's trying to get their code in, everything's trying to get approved, and it's just actually quite miserable. So, um, so there's a, a couple of years ago, do you guys remember the old Nationwide logo? It's a boxy, called it the frame, all right? But now the new Nationwide logo is the eagle with the end behind it. So a few years ago, I was a developer, and. Uh, I was working on a project and we had a login screen that had the boxy frame logo. I had to change that logo to the new logo, right? So when I started doing that work, we missed the window for the uh, release that was happening two to three weeks later. So I made a change which took all of, I mean, I'll be generous and say it was 10 minutes. It was probably more like two minutes, but let's just, you know, say it was 10 to make it seem like I was doing it a lot harder than it was. Um, <laughs> so I make this change, you know, testing is very minimal on something like that. And I said, all right, ready to go to production. And they said, all right, you can go to production next month. So a five minute change took about 45 days before it could make it to production. I mean, it's kind of ridiculous, all right? So, all right. All right, so for our infrastructure, I mean, most of our infrastructure is dedicated, it's on-prem. Um, we have two data centers, and then we have other places where we have a lot of test, uh, test infrastructure. But in order to provision anything, like servers and databases, I mean, it takes a long time. You fill out a request, and then you end up filling out another request, and then you end up talking to people, and then they talk to people, and by the time you get everything said and done, you're talking like weeks and months to provision anything, any sort of uh, infrastructure artifact. So when Jared and I first met, uh, Jared was working on a team and uh, what he was doing was they were refreshing their servers. And, uh, and so from the time that they started to the time that they actually got those servers in a production state was a span of eight months from the first time they put in a request till they actually got these servers. So at the end of this project, they have a celebration uh, happy hour. Jared's talking to one of the infrastructure engineers and he's like, all right, so everything we know now, all the work that we've put in, everything we've done, 
if we had to do the exact same thing today, how long would it take? Does anyone want to guess what the answer is? Who said two weeks? You are probably the most optimistic person I have ever met in my life. You probably ask for uniform, unicorns for Christmas instead of ponies. And I am so sorry to break your heart. No, it is not two weeks. <laughs> Who else? Eight months, exactly, eight months. All of the manual process and everything was exactly eight months. So, you know, that's getting kind of, you know, unacceptable. Now, to our credit, you know, we've been doing it this way for a long time. And what we've sacrificed in speed, we actually have really great quality with the things that we build. But, you know, since we've been doing it for a long time, as time has gone on, you know, the tools to build software and develop it quickly, and quite frankly, just the, uh, the philosophies that we have on how we develop software has changed. And in order for us to stay competitive, we're gonna have to move on from this model to a different model. So as we said, where we're going, you know, you can see that DevOps is just a small part of this. And, um, you know, we're gonna have to break things up. These monolithic things are gonna have to get broken up into pieces like uh, microservices and APIs. And then our small batch, like, we're gonna have to have smaller batch sizes because with smaller batch sizes and more frequent deployments, we're gonna have a lower risk than what we have now because that means one week in a month, we have a really large risk for what we're doing. And so for infrastructure, the same thing, you know, we actually have some testing parts where we can deploy infrastructure in a matter of minutes. Um, Jared's gonna talk about some of our experiments that we do. And um, during that time, we have these show and tells where we bring all these leaders in so they can see some of the stuff that we're doing. And there's one show and tell that uh, Jared was talking about some database thing and uh, he said, yeah, well, you know, I got this database set up and we use this new team and we went from, you know, having to set up a database for five days down to five minutes. And you could just see people's faces. There was like the shock and awe of, oh my, you went from days to minutes. In reality, the shock should have been, it took you five days to do that. That's where the shock should have been. It shouldn't have been that it was five minutes, all right? <laughs> All right, so to get to where we're going, we know that we're gonna to have to change the way we work. I mean, the way our culture is, is our teams are very siloed. So what we're gonna to have to do is we're gonna to have to have some interdependency between these teams and we're gonna to have to break those silos down. So even if we have two teams that are working on the same projects, we really have to get it to a point where they're communicating more and the priorities are the same for those projects. Like currently, we pull in work and we put it in Rational Team Concert and then there's some integration there for how we do our releases with Urban Code Release. Now the problem is that the team that administers RTC and the team that administers UCR, two totally separate teams. Not just totally separate teams, they sit in two totally separate buildings. So if you think about it, if there's an issue on either end, you may not have that same priority on the end that's not having the issue. And we need, to, we need to take a step back and look at it from a higher level and look at things in a systematic way instead of the way we're looking at them now. All right, so you know, we can't just go in and just say, all right, one day, everybody, we're gonna do things completely different because that would make mass chaos. So Jared's gonna talk about how we're taking two of our lines and how we've eased uh, some of the DevOps principles into the organization. Thank you. All right, thanks, Preston. So yeah, as Preston said, uh, with 200 lines, nothing, no change is really easy. So when we went about doing this, we wanted to try and figure out how best to get some experiments done, get some knowledge under our belt without changing everything immediately. Uh, we really wanted to run this kind of using the principles of Agile and DevOps, right? We, we do it with uh, iterations, we have work that comes in in small batch sizes, we're doing test and learn, so uh, our goal is to get something out there, it doesn't really need to be fully polished, just play with it, see if something works, and if it doesn't, okay, great, failure's also part of the process. We'll try something, we'll move on, we'll try something else. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, that's too bad, it's very hard to read up there. Okay, so in the Top corner up here, what we've got, it says it's the DevOps leadership team. So this is the team that's kind of prioritizing the backlog of work that our model lines are doing. Um, they have ideas of their own that they're feeding into that backlog, but we really want this to be practitioner-led. So not sure if you can really see it on here, but these are our model lines. We have two of them today. Um, the model lines are closest to the work, so they're the ones that know where they need to change. They know where their bottlenecks are. They know where they're having issues. 
So there's arrows feeding back up into the backlog. And actually what we discovered was that the model lines would come up with ideas for things that would make them more efficient that the leadership team never even thought of. So uh, that's very important to the, the model, the way this works. Additionally, it's important to mention that these model lines, they're actually doing business value work still. They're not just playing with DevOps and seeing what happens. They still have work that they have to deliver and get out in front of our customers. So with that in mind, uh, when they do an experiment, they're doing it with real work. But at the same time, we want to kind of prime the experiments for them so they don't have to spend a bunch of time setting up tools or learning how to get some process working or some new technology. So in the bottom left corner here, we have what's called the DevOps platform team. That's actually the team that I'm on now. And uh, actually, so is Preston. So what we do is we take new tools and new technologies and new practices, and we kind of experiment with them, get them set up so that the model lines can be ready to go as soon as they get some work thrown their way. Finally, in the top right corner, uh, we have a governance team. So it's easy for the model lines to do things that just impact them, right? If you're just inside the line, there's not really a lot of risk of impacting anybody else. But with the types of changes that we want to do, uh, it can have broad sweeping effects across the entire organization. So while we want this to be practitioner-led, we actually have support all the way up to the highest levels of executives in IT. So that governance team is made up of several executives across nationwide and also two of our CIOs. And they can kind of give us the air cover to do things that maybe other teams aren't quite ready for or aren't understanding why we're doing it. It's very important to the model. The last thing that I want to mention is that right in the middle, we have uh, the two arrows facing off against each other. So sometimes we try something or we have an idea for something we want to try, but maybe we have more than one idea. We actually have the teams play off of each other. They're actually kind of competitive, so it worked out pretty well to throw different things at them and see what worked better. But we do A-B tests, and we see which idea works the best. And out of all the ideas that we find that we think are the best, they go back up to the leadership team, and then it's the leadership team's job to figure out how to operationalize that across all 210 of our lines. They do things like using systems thinking because when you have so many teams, you really have to think about how you roll things out so you get consistency and you get people following the right practices. So before I move on to the next slide, I'm gonna throw a few people under the bus. Josh and Brock are sitting over here and they're actually on one of the two model lines. So if you have questions for them, they would love for you to come up and talk to them after this talk and see how it's been going. And get it directly from the practitioners. All right, so um, how are we getting things into this backlog? What are kind of our guiding principles? So um, we have seven principles here, and there maybe are a few other ones as well. But we've really been using the DevOps handbook as a guide. Um, we found that you know, reading through that book, you get a lot of ideas about what you can do to kind of improve your organization. So things like version control everything. And this doesn't just apply to code. It's infrastructure. It's configuration for your CI, CD tools. It's your test data. If everything's in version control, then the risk of changing it is that much less, right? If you put something in production and it breaks, well, then it's easy to just revert to the previous revision and you're back in a known good working state. Uh, additionally, with fast and reliable automation tests, uh, you can get the feedback much quicker than if you're doing manual processes. So if you have manual testing as a step in your pipeline, you can't really ever get to the point where you're deploying you know, five times a day or maybe even once a day because you've got people that need to spend dedicated time getting things done. So instead, if you can automate all those processes, you get that feedback quicker, and you also get the advantage of not having any manual steps where you, know, you can have human error introduced. Continuous integration into trunk. So if you've ever heard Spotify talk about their squad model or any other talk that they have, they actually talk about code being in feature branches or project branches for a long time. They consider that a type of technical debt. And I think that's a really good way to think about it, because uh, at least our experiences within Nationwide are when we have a project branch that lives for about six months or something like that while we're working on a project, when we go to integrate that back in, it's a very painful process. It usually takes, we'll say, a week to get everything merged back in and actually get it working again, right? When you have code living off to the side, as other things change, you're going to introduce defects when you start to merge that code back in. So one of our key principles is to always be integrating into the trunk and getting code out to production as quickly as possible. Preston already talked about automated infrastructure, so I'm not going to talk about that one again. Automate and enable low-risk releases. So as Preston said, our releases are very high ceremony. They're dangerous. People hate doing them. It's in the middle of the night. It's painful. And when something breaks, it takes a long time to fix. That's not the way that uh, we need to be when we're moving forward, right? Risks should be so mundane that nobody cares when you're doing one. And when you look at companies like Facebook or Google or Amazon, that's the way they feel about it. They do it all the time, and it's just a non-event. So we really want to get there. Preston also already kind of talked about low risk or architecting for low risk releases. So decoupling your applications into pieces so they can be independently released and deployed just lowers your risk, right? If you're not touching, if you're touching a monolith, then you always have the risk of 
you touch a piece of code and you don't realize where else it's used and you just break something within the application. With a microservices architecture, you kind of get that low risk, uh, you, get, you lower the risk. But of course, there's a lot of other things that increase, like your amount of infrastructure that you have to manage and you know, um, the amount of work that it takes just to get all that code into production and keep it running. Finally, monitor everything. So as a whole, I'd say we're pretty good with monitoring our applications in production, but we're maybe not so good when it comes to knowing when things are breaking in our test environments or just knowing how well things are working through our CI and CD pipelines. Um, you really need that information if you want to know where your slowdowns are so you can attack those, right? That's a lot of what uh, Gene Kim talks about in the handbook. I think it's one of the three ways. Uh, find your bottlenecks, figure out how to remove them, and then things will flow faster as they flow smoothly through your pipeline. So historically, we haven't really had good insight into when things are breaking. So that's all well and good, but let's see some results, right? We can talk about this all day, but since the beginning of the year, our model lines have actually been running experiments, and we've seen some great successes out of them that we've looked to start to try to operationalize across the company. First of all, uh, Nationwide historically has been on Subversion as a version control system. We use a couple of other ones as well, but the majority of the company uses SVN. At the beginning of the year, our two model lines were the first two lines to transition over to Git and GitHub. And what we discovered was that GitHub just works better when it comes to doing things like merges. Uh, we took a merge that Josh's team had that took about eight hours when we did it in Subversion because it was a very long-lived project branch. It took that long to figure out how to get everything integrated properly into Trunk again. And when we replayed the exact same merge history, uh, history of commits and merged it in GitHub, it took about 45 minutes. That's just how much better the tool works. So while we say DevOps isn't tools, in some cases the tools do make the difference, but the rest of it's really about culture and practices. Um, Historically, database deployments at Nationwide have also been very manual. What we found through our research is that when you have a data change that has to go into the release, it actually takes about 68 hours worth of time to get that developed, tested, and pushed out to production. And the reason for that primarily is that we have a lot of test environments and it's manual process to get those changes implemented everywhere. Additionally, uh, there's handoffs to other teams. You have to go to the operations team when you want to have something done in a higher environment. And uh, we also do database refreshes throughout the month, so data gets removed, and then somebody has to realize that it's missing and go back and figure out how to put it back in again. So using a tool like Liquibase, we're actually able to automate that process. And every time the application gets deployed, Liquibase looks at the version that's been deployed and all the data changes that have been applied, and it figures out what the delta is, and it'll get your environment back up to where it's supposed to be based off of the version that's deployed. Yeah, you can't really see our pictures. All right, well, fast and reliable automated tests. So one of our worst lead times in the company that we found so far in our experiments is related to performance testing. Performance testing at Nationwide happens within a dedicated team in our infrastructure organization. So every team submits requests to them, and then they run your performance testing for you and give you back the results and tell you if you have issues. Uh, the way it works today, you actually have to submit that request 90 days ahead of time to get them to get your work planned. And the reason for that, it's not that they're bad at their jobs, right? It's that they have to support 200 plus lines, right? So they really need to plan ahead if they want to get work done. Well, in a DevOps world, that's completely unacceptable, right? So we kind of flipped the script. We made PT testing self-service, and now our model lines actually own that process themselves. And they work with our performance testing team in more of a consulting nature, right? They are the experts. They can help you if you're troubleshooting something and you're not really sure what to do. But ultimately, you're responsible for running the tests. And by flipping to that model, uh, there was a little bit of a learning curve. It uses um, VBScript, and none of our teams actually write in VBScript, but it turns out it's pretty easy for a developer to learn another language. It wasn't really a barrier. So we were able to get that 90 days down to about two hours, and that's about how long it takes to actually set up the scripts, run it, and then get the results back. Huge efficiency gain. And when you look at a lot of the experiments we've done, self-service is kind of a key cultural change that we've tried to implement at Nationwide. If you can empower teams to do their own work and not have to go to somebody else and you know, submit a request and then wait, you get huge advantages like this. We're running short on time, so I'm going to skip the second one and talk about the last one, which unfortunately you can't see the picture. That's a picture of a GitHub pull request. And what that's showing is that now when you make a coding change and submit it for code review to master, we actually run a bunch of automated checks on that branch before it can ever be merged. Uh, we do things like compile the code, run the unit tests, do static analysis with a tool like SonarCube to see if you have good code quality, and then also check your code coverage to see if you've increased it or decreased it. And with that, uh, we've essentially pulled quality checks as far left as we can. So the developer gets this feedback as soon as they try to issue the pull request. It never goes into master and can never impact anybody else if any of these checks fail. Um, with this, we've seen that breakages in our master branch have gone down dramatically over time. 
enable and automate low risk releases. So as I said, we really want to strive to get all of our code integrated back into master and pushed out to production as quickly as possible. So we started using dark launching techniques to do that. And in doing so, uh, all of our code goes in with every monthly release, right? We still only do 12 a year, with the exception of one of our model lines, which I'll get to in a second. But every piece of code that's been written for every project that's happening goes in with every release. And with that, we saw when we did analysis before we started, it was about 97 days for in, on average from the time a code commit happened until the time that code actually made it to production. Now we've been able to get that down to, port, uh, to about 45 days. So we've, ha we've halved it. Uh, that's another great efficiency gain of about 50%. So uh, is anybody familiar with Rocket Chat? I'm sure the Nationwiders are. All right, so Rocket Chat is a persistent chat platform. It's very similar to Slack. And using that platform, we've gotten great advantages just from having all of our conversations be visible across the company and all in one place. But one of the other really powerful things you can do with it is chatbots. So one of our model lines actually built a chatbot and uh, it does their builds and deploys for them. That used to be a very manual, time-consuming process, but now instead you can just go into the bot or go into Rocket Chat and say, bot, build and deploy master into ST. And then about five minutes later, it's out there. So great efficiency gain. Additionally, we actually found that there was kind of a barrier for people learning our build process. It's kind of complicated. But now there's really no barrier, right? It's so easy as just typing a sentence into our chat platform, and then you can deploy code out into any of our test environments. All right, so this is probably the coolest one that we have. Doing release when ready. We really want to get away from this time-based approach and start going with a certification-based approach to getting code to production. If you can prove that your code is high quality and that it's good to go, then why should you have to wait until the monthly release to do it, right? It, it's so obvious, it's common sense, but why? It's, for some reason, it's very difficult to do. So what we've started doing is we've started using blue-green deploys. Uh, is everybody familiar with what a blue-green deploy is? I can, okay, I can explain it really quickly. So a blue-green deploy is where you've got your app Oh, you've got your application running in production, and then you deploy to production and stand up another environment right next to it in production as well, but it's not taking any traffic from your users. So you do all your testing against that instance, and once everything passes, then you flip all the traffic over to the new instance, and now your code's out there, and shut off the old instance, and it goes away. There's kind of some automated infrastructure that works behind the scenes there. But with that, our one model line that's been doing this has actually had 50 production releases over the course of three months, where they only could have had three if they were following the time-based model. And all these deployments have happened during the day instead of in the middle of the night, which makes our developers you know, incredibly thrilled not to have to get up in the middle of the night and do this very painful process. So uh, we've seen huge gains there. We're actually working on operationalizing this across the company. Any team can actually start to pick this up. We're not quite there yet, but it's getting close. Uh, yeah, that looks really good. OK, well, the color is what matters. So don't worry about what it says in the boxes. So. Uh, one of our model lines, this was actually something that our model line kind of brought up to the leadership team. They said that they were having an issue where code was breaking in their build pipeline and it wouldn't get deployed to their ST environment where they do their uh, regression testing every night. It takes about eight hours, so they have to do it at night. Now that's a different problem. That's because we have a large monolithic application. But the fact still remains that the deploys weren't happening and they were missing out on a whole day of testing. So work would start to pile up and then you'd have that much more to do the next day. So this was actually a super easy fix that Josh worked on with uh, one of our other leads on the team. And this is actually, not that you can read it, it's an off-the-shelf plugin for Jenkins that shows you the status of all your projects. And this is actually sitting in their team space on a 65-inch monitor. So it's so incredibly obvious when the build's broken that you don't actually have to be in their team space to see it. As soon as you turn the corner in the building, you can tell if the SSC team is green or if they've got something broken and they're working on it. This decreased the time to fix breakages to, or at least to knowing that there's a problem, to within minutes instead of hours or maybe even a day. All right, so I'm gonna turn it back over to Preston and he's gonna talk about how we're gonna try to spread these concepts across the company. Okay, cool. All right, so uh, what you see here is, um, what well, Jared said, we want this to be very practitioner-led, right? So we don't want it to be that you know, from on high we come down and say, you're gonna do this and you're gonna do this right now and you're gonna do it this way. We want the practitioners to, you know, get a feel for what they need to do so they can make this journey on their own. So this actual graphic is something that's being uh, sent around to every application area. And where it says outfitters, you can't really see that, but that's really just our, um, our standard enterprise applications that we have. You know, there's like GitHub, Splunk, Urban Code. And so every application area, has that base start. They have those applications. And then what we mean is like everyone's going to start at Basecamp and on their DevOps journey, they're going to make their path all the way up to the summit, right? 
So what we're telling people to start with is the first thing we really want them to do is to start out with DevOps Handbook book clubs. And there's a couple reasons for that. One reason is we want them to understand what we're trying to accomplish. And the other, another reason is we want them to understand why we're trying to accomplish that. You know, it's, it's easy to tell someone what to do, but when they understand why, you know, it really clicks in their head. And the third reason is every application area is going to have different stumbling blocks. They're going to have different problems. And what we want them to do is while they're reading this book, identify what those problems are, and that'll help them make their path up this journey. All right? So, because every application area is going to have something different. Okay? So, as they go across this journey, what, if you look in the corner there, we got uh, a compass, and this is what we call our true north. So the state of DevOps report, there were four metrics that they say were important. There was a lead time, mean time to recover, deployment frequency, and change rate success. All right? So what my team is doing with the help of other teams is we're trying to create a, uh, a dashboard, an enterprise dashboard for every application area so they, can, so they can track those metrics. And they can see their metrics versus another application area's metrics. And so as they move up this path, their lead time and their mean time to recover should, re, should go down. And then their uh, frequency of deployment and change rate success should go up. So if you're on this path and you're starting to see those numbers change and you're starting to see like how much success you're getting, it's really gonna motivate you to keep going up that path. And if you're a slower adopter, and then you start to realize that everybody else around you is having a lot more success, then you're going to want to get motivated to get on that. All right? And a big deal of this is, like I said, we really don't want to have this as a mandate that's coming through. At the end of all this, we want everybody to feel like they own some part of this. Yeah, the, one thing I'll add. <laughs> the one thing I'll add to that is that uh, teams across the company have been hearing what we've been doing within our model lines, and they're excited. They've been asking to start with it. So it's, it's really worked as kind of a grassroots campaign. People are jumping onto it and really want to see what they can do to, to make their development lives easier. And also, this is a simplified picture. There's probably about twice as much information on the internal one, but there's a lot of nationwide -y speak in it, so we kind of eliminated that to make it a little easier to look at. So yeah, that's what we've got. Uh, we've seen great results with our model lines. We're starting to roll it out with our teams, and you know maybe we'll be back next year to tell you how we've done uh, in another year. Uh, thank you for your time. Any questions? Or are we out? <laughs>
you know, if we're looking across the industry, we're seeing how fast other groups are, are having their development come out. And it's really, part of it is the excitement of being able to do things faster, and part of it really is necessity. We're gonna have to do this to be competitive. And I'll add to that one too. So uh, it did take our bosses, they're not executives, right? They're just leaders of developers. And it did take them putting bugs in the ears of our CIOs for quite a while. I mean, they'd heard what's going on in the industry, so it wasn't like a complete surprise. But we had to start small, right? We had to do things that were within the control of our teams first and show, you know, we can be more efficient in the way we're working today. Uh, Grassroots is great. In a big company, it's not enough. We do have great support from our leadership, but it definitely has taken time to get them there.